So, um, we finished up the other day talking about monopolies, and then we talked about regulating monopolies as far as to keep keep them from getting too big. If they're going to get too big, if companies get too big and end up being like a monopoly, we're going to break it up. Um, and then we talked about some of the how the government's going to be regulating monopoly if they are going to let it live. So we've had pure competition. Many, 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 many producers that have no power, and then we've had a monopoly, which is only one producer, and they have all the power to grain storage. Uh, now we're going to be talking about the chip groups that are in the grain. Um, oligopoly, oligopoly, which is kind of oligopoly, and monopolistic competition. So first is oligopoly. An oligopoly is a market when instead of just one player, you have a small handful of players. So you're going to have a few big companies instead of just one big company going, and it's going to be fewer big companies where duopoly is duo, what's your, what duo, what two. two. So a duopoly is the form of an oligopoly, but instead of one company, several companies, not thousands, not millions, maybe half a dozen, maybe a dozen, depending. Um, Exactly the automobile industry. Start naming off the car companies. Ford, GM, Chrysler, Honda, Toyota, Nissan, Volkswagen. Jeep. Jeep, well that's part of Chrysler. Oh yeah, Dodge. Part of Chrysler. Um, Mercedes. That's it. Mercedes. Um, used to be part of Chrysler. Years. Um, and, and, and there's three or four more of them that I'm like literally blanking on at the moment, but you, we're talking half a dozen of them. Airlines, handful of them. Cell phones, the cell, the cell service providers, Verizon, Sprint, AT, ATT, Mobile. Okay, then you've got, as far as networks, then you've got what, uh, US cellular? There it is, the first place. But then you've got a lot of these other like straight talk and that kind of stuff. They don't run a network, they just buying and reselling fine. On ATT or Verizon, something like that. So you only got one from there. Uh, duopoly, Coke and Pepsi. I mean, it doesn't get much more duopoly than that. I mean, granted, there are other soda companies, but Coca Cola and Pepsi Cola, 22 of them there, that's probably 85% of the soda market. But I'm just going to use that as an example, even though it ain't quite really a true monopoly. I mean, duopoly. So, talking a handful of companies. So, just for you to complete this the parallel slide here. You know, it's some firms, two or more. Each firm is going to have some power. And that, that power they have depends on just how big they are compared to everybody else in the industry. And we'll get into detail about that. And it's high barriers to entry. It's not the, the, the obstacles aren't as high as the ones to get into what a monopoly is doing, but it's pretty stinking hot. How tough is it for you to go ahead and I don't know, build a car company and start manufacturing automobiles to sell? Pretty tough. How tough would it be for you to decide, well, I'm going to go ahead and start making sodas and try to compete against Coca Pepsi? Pretty tough, right? It ain't impossible because there's other people like our viewers, Sundrop, that are fighting a good fight. It ain't impossible, but it's pretty hard. Um, and that's why, that's part of the reason why there's only a small handful of people doing it. Airlines, how expensive is that? Cruise, cruise lines, there's mm, Royal Caribbean and Carnival and Disney and mm, Norwegian. Norwegian and, you know, uh, yeah, good luck with them now. Uh, but you, know, you got just a half a dozen, how, how, how expensive is it, I don't know, buy a cruise ship or build a cruise ship, get into the business. So. Here's the fun one. The companies are price takers. Because customers have options. If we don't like Coke, we can do we don't like Coke's price, what do we do? Drink peasant, right? So can Coke say, well, you know, we're, we're the real thing and everything else is not the real thing. So we're gonna charge five dollars a bottle. What's gonna happen? We're all gonna be drinking Pepsi instead, right? So they're going to have to set their prices in line with everybody else. They, they can have some, some flexibility in prices here again, depending on 
how big you are, talk about market power, you have a little bit of flexibility in prices, but oh, there's a difference between the price of a Mercedes and the price of a Honda, right? But you know, it's not like one I'm selling for eight hundred thousand dollars, the other one's selling for twelve thousand dollars. It ain't that big difference there. Uh, you know, cell phones, you know, Verizon, AT and T, T Mobile, you know, Yacht plans, pretty close. You know, um, iPhones versus Samsung phones versus Google Pixel, prices are you know in the ballpark of one another. There is some differences, but you, you can't go to the extreme. So you actually are ultimately with an asterisk that we'll talk about later. The companies are generally price takers. The products are differentiated. They are somewhat similar. It's somewhat different. Think about cars. Four tires, gas pedals, the long speedy one on the right, the brake pedal is the shorter one in the middle, steering wheel, radio over here, gear shift down here, all right? Seats in front, seats in the back. You know, 80% of it's the same, but there are some quality differences there. By, you know, there's one of them shaped like a box, the other one is it nice and sleek and aerodynamic. One of them can go from zero to 30, the other one can go from zero to 230. You know, there are some differences, but there's a lot of similarities there. Cruise ships. Okay, some of them have Mickey Mouse and them all walking around on cruise ships. Some of them have other Scooby Doo walking around on a cruise ship, but it's still a ship, right? There's differences, similarities. So there's somewhat, so there are somewhat similar substitutes. Is there a difference between Coke and Pepsi? A little bit. Is there a difference between Coke and an LA Yellow? Or Coke and a Mountain Dew? Yeah, but when it grain, in the grain, in the grand scheme of things, what are we talking about? Liquid with sugar and caffeine. All right? Okay, corn syrup. So here, advertising has a big role. We have four kinds, four, four kinds of advertising. Informative, let them know that you exist. Cost competitive, hey, we're the cheapest. Uh, quality competitive, we're the best. And persuasive, you know you want it. And they'll use all four of these. And I think I probably have a slide about it, but I'm just while I'm here, I'm gonna make sure I can't remember. Uh, code. Y'all see, you know, the gas stations or whatever that they've got to sign, you know, or, or restaurants that's like, oh, Bob's family restaurant. And there's a Coke logo on the top of this. It's informative for reminding you that they exist. Sometimes it is warmer weather is going to come. Y'all just start seeing a commercial where the whole TV screen is filled with glass, filled with ice, and the soda is slowly pouring in. And you see the bubbles, you hear the fizz, you hear somebody sound like Gary White go, oh, yeah, you know what you want, right? Or Hardee's has done that, you know, for, with a big hamburger, but they just sort of drop it down and you're just all that hamburger and dripping cheese and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, you know, you want it. Kind of, as persuasive. Cost competitive, we're cheaper than they are. Quality competitive, we're better than they are. If you're Monopoly, well, you, these are the four kinds of advertisement. I can talk about this, but I didn't. Is a Monopoly be doing cost competitive advertising? Because who are they comparing themselves to? So, We're cheaper than ourselves. Quality comparison. We're better than ourselves. There's nobody else. So they're not going to be doing this. So it's just a matter of do they need to do any persuading? And depending on what the product is, usually the monopolies that we let exist are going to be like cable and electricity and that kind of stuff. But guess what? Customers kind of, when I'm moving into an area, I'm going to hook up electricity to my house. I might even think about it. So they don't need to do what you know you want electricity. Wouldn't your life be better if you have electricity in your house? So they're not really doing a persuasive being very mostly informative advertising for a monopoly. But all four of these, all four of these for oligopolies and duopolies, they're gonna do all four. Um, monopoly only would do informative, pure competition, remember they're not doing any of it. Pure competition of farmers they ain't advertising anybody. Just loading it up in a truck and taking it to party. So, the point of advertising is to artificially create a monopoly in the minds of the customers. That is the point of advertising. 
We want to convince you that our product is the right product for you. So when you're thinking about things, you're going to think about us. Pick a, pick a restaurant. Okay. Well, no, it's an actual restaurant Okay, I, 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 I get it. I would, I would like, I have been in Blackstone. Um, I'm not even sure if I've ever actually been to Blackstone, believe it or not. Not that apparently I haven't missed it a whole time. Okay. Okay. Brothers Pizza. Brothers Pizza, their advertising is to tell you, we're the best in the town. We're the best pizza. We've got freshest ingredients. We're good pizza, good people, good service, good price, good everything. And they're trying to lock you into thinking Brothers Pizza is the best pizza. So any day that, so in, they're trying to get it in your mind when you think pizza, you think Brothers. So tonight, when you're like sitting around and you're like, hmm, I'm hungry, do I want chicken? No, I don't want a burger. No, I don't want a pizza. Yeah, and you pick up the phone and you dial Brothers' number without even thinking about it. Because Brothers to you is pizza. That's what advertising is trying to do for you. Sun drop to me is yellow soda. The other stuff exists. If I'm in the mood for brown soda, well, maybe I'll go with a Coke, maybe I'll go with a Dr. Pepper. If I'm in the mood for yellow soda, I'm going for sun drop. I'm not even going to think about it. Look at the edge. This is it. Coke. What's your slogan? It's a real thing. So if you're drinking something other than Coke, then you're not drinking the real thing. You're drinking a substitute. You're drinking a coffee. You're drinking other thing. Maybelline makeup. Because it's worth it. Yeah, I think it's in it. Maybelline was out there. Because they also have Maybelline. Maybe it's Maybelline. I'm like, oh, well. But okay, hey, Coke slogan now is just enjoy. Well, well, that's another one that they cycle through, but the, the, the real tagline is that it's a real thing. But they exist before Pepsi. I think. Technically, I, they both get the same about the same time. I don't know which one you have heard of before. If you're from North Carolina, then you can say Pepsi. If you're from Georgia, you can say Coca Cola, but there you go. So, um, but they're trying, but that's what they're trying to do. We're, we are, we're brothers, it's pizza to you. You want pizza? You call brothers. You want chicken? You call Kentucky Fried Chicken. You want Chinese? I'm sorry. You want a hamburger? You go five guys. You just don't think about it. That's what the advertising is trying to lock you in. They're trying to do whatever they can to convince you that we're the right choice for you. So then every time you want a pizza, you go into brothers. Brothers is the only pizza for you. For whatever reasons they've convinced you. So then what can they do? Oh, no. What can they do? They can start acting like a monopoly. If Brothers is the only pizza for you, Brothers is the only pizza for you, the rest of them are dead to you. If we've got you convinced that Brothers is it, then what can Brothers do? So we can start raising our prices a little bit. Because you're not going anywhere, you're not as likely to go anywhere because we've convinced you that we're the right pizza for you. That's what advertising is trying to do. Yeah. How high is Sun Drop going to have to raise your prices before I switch to drinking Mountain Dew? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, let's hope they never try to find out. Right. So, but if this is what they're trying to do, convince you there's no substitute, and if there is no substitute, then we can charge whatever we want. Five words, five letters, six letters. <laughs> Me count, good. The iPhone. They've got you locked in. We're different from the Android phones. We're different from that Windows phone that doesn't exist anymore. We're different from the Blackberry that doesn't exist anymore. We care about your privacy. We're going to be making the decisions to do whatever for you. And we know that we got the courage to say you don't need a headphone jack. You would rather have a phone that is thinner than a sheet of paper and has bad battery life. But we, so we're going to do that for you. And you're locked in because the apps that you buy only will work on an iPhone. The music songs that you buy, well, okay, they finally do PRM free, but if you buy any shows or movies or anything off of the iTunes store, they'll only work on your iPhone. So guess what? The iPhone is the only thing for you when your phone dies. What are you going to do? Well, I kind of, you know, stuck having to get another iPhone. 
What did I Apple? What's Apple done to the prices of their iPhones in the last couple of years? Jack them up. Jack them up. What have they done with the quality of their service? Jack them up. Retail system. But that, that's what they're trying to do. Once they know you're locked in because you've got 10 years worth of apps that you bought, you've got 10 years worth of music you bought, 10 years worth of videos you bought, you aren't going anywhere. So if you're not going anywhere, then we can raise our prices. So they do whatever they can to try to convince you. We respect the privacy of what Apple says, right? What's that? They sell more adapters. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yes. We respect your privacy and your right to have dongles for three times the price. So anyway, but that's the number one goal for a monopoly. I mean, for advertising is to try to lock the customers in because once you get them locked in, you've got control over them. So talk about market power. How much power does a company have in this industry depends on what? Well, depends on how big you are compared to everybody else and how many other everybody else's there are. So we do something called the concentration ratio where we look at generally like the top four biggest four companies and what percentage of the market do those big, big four run. For cell phone networks, Verizon, AT, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, what percentage of the networks do they run? Oh, they like 90%, fairly concentrated. Because I mean, who else besides US Cellular naming another cell phone company? That has the powers and there's no one that has the network. All the other substances are Yeah, you can't do it. Um, okay, let's see the big, okay, the big four soda companies Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper. Canada driving. Yeah, so guess what? Which is pretty much nailed probably 90 some odd percent of the soda market. Then you've got the leftovers, well, you know, the, the Sands Club soda and the Food Lion brand soda, and, you know, right? So those are highly concentrated. Cars? I don't know, Ford, Toyota, Honda, Chevy. Those are probably the biggest four. But between those four, where do they, you, you may be only talking about 40% of the cars out there. Because you think about all them Dodges and Jeeps and VWs and Mercedeses and Lexi and yeah and you know all the other cars. So okay, so maybe those big four they might be about fifty percent of the market. So you, we've got a whole you know a dozen car companies to choose from. Where you know for cell phones we really only have four for cell service. You know, we're selling four. So that's how you would be looking at. Market power, concentration, the concentration ratio there. Um, so, as I came to that, advertising, they're going to be doing it. Advertising is, is huge. It's humongous. It's got to be done. Because competition is fierce. Because you and I, as customers, have options. So the fun thing is, is if one company does anything different, does the competition get a notice? Yeah, yeah they're going to find out how quickly. Pretty darn quick. Because they only have to keep an eye on a handful of other companies. It ain't like you know, a farmer here in Virginia needs to keep tabs on how many soybeans a farmer in South Carolina. So, no. It's just, you know, Verizon, they just have to monitor, well, what is T-Mobile doing as far as their data plans, service plans, and where they put up new towers? Where is at and doing, what are they doing with their service plans? You know, Coke, they just keep an eye on Pepsi. Pepsi keeps an eye on Coke. Maybe, maybe if they're really bored, they'll occasionally say, well, I wonder what Dr. Pepper's doing. I wonder what Suntrop is doing. So, it's fairly easy for them to keep up with what their competitors are doing. And what your competitors do really matters because 
especially the closer the substitute ability is for these things. Remember, you last this a few chapters ago or a couple of days ago. Uh, it, it, the elasticity, when we talk about substitute couplings, how closely related are these things? Coke and Pepsi, they're almost the same thing. So if Coke was to change their, lower their price, what's going to happen to Pepsi sales? They're going to tank in a hurry. So what's going to happen the moment that Coke lowers their price? Pepsi's going to lower their price too. Or else they're going to lose all customers. So, any increase, um, I don't have any, any increase, what, like lowering your prices or increasing your advertising? Ultimately, those are the two ways that you can increase your sales, lower your price, increase your advertising. It's going to be noticed immediately by the, comp the competition, and they're going to come. Dude, all right, well, language. Competition is going to notice immediately and they're going to respond immediately by doing what? Increasing their advertising, lowering their price. Too. It's going to happen. So, yeah, gas stations. Um, okay, gas stations are a little bit different. But, well, they don't set their price. They, they, I mean, the gas stations set it themselves. The gas stations are usually independently owned. But, but uh, there's thousands of gas stations, but you think in any given area, something like Tiburi before. So it's sort of, uh, they're kind of like an oligopoly for their area. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, though, they're not really an oligopoly, but for that, their little market. Because nobody's like, I'm going to go down to Richmond. I'm going to leave Richmond. I'm going to go down to Blackstone and give you some gas. No. Right. So what ends up happening when you've got three gas stations on, well, four gas stations on all four quarters of the intersection? And when one of them lowers their price, where's everybody going to stop? The cheapest store. So when one of them lowers their price, what's going to happen to the other three stores? They ain't going to sell much gas unless they lower their price. And so what's going to happen? They're going to lower their price. But you end up getting a price for it here. Good. Give me the name of a gas station. Exxon. Okay. We've got the intersection. We've got Exxon here. Shell, BP, and huh? Parker. Okay. Parker, the local underdog that I'm with. So I say, let's go with Exxon. So Exxon, they said, they decided, they're going to lower their price. Why? Yeah, because they need, they want or need to increase sales. So they, in order to increase sales, they got to steal from the other three, right? Because uh, like I said, they ain't like people going to be like coming down from Richmond. Yeah, I want to go to that Exxon down there. No. So the only way that they can increase their sales is to steal from these three. So we need more sales. We're going to lower our price. So then what happens? Shell says, Beep. and they lower their price too. BP lowers theirs, Parker lowers theirs. So guess what? Now they all are selling for the same price again, right? But Exxon is right back in the exact same spot that they were before. We need to lower our price in order to increase sales. So, they so what may end up happening? That they lower their price again. And maybe Shell will go ahead and lower their price, BP will lower their price for partners because they say, dang it, we can't afford to lower our price anymore, right? Because we're at small price. But you end up with a price war. Or maybe Exxon started out lowering their price a little bit to steal sales, and BP's like, well, middle fingers in the air. You lower your price by five cents, we're going to lower ours by ten. You put one mine in the hospital, I'll put one of yours in the morgue. Okay, anybody know that line? In the vegetables and Al Capone. Uh, Robert De Niro. Yeah, Robert De Niro. Yeah. That movie came out before Yellow Orange. Um, Kevin Costner, um, John Congress. It's a classic. <clears throat> the one scene with the baseball bat is worth it to watch that one alone. And he goes and he goes nuts one other time. So so Al Capone goes nuts like twice in that movie. 
goes on. Anyway, okay. So, okay, I'm going to go through this fast. Don't lose any sleep over. It's the idea that what something we do in economics is the idea of game theory, where we sit there and you start trying to figure out all the different scenarios for what can happen to different behaviors that somebody does. The uh, classic example of game theory, working on a theory is, Will and Matthew get arrested. They, after leaving class, they're riding down the road together. Okay, they're riding down the road together and the cop sees a gun stick out the window and bam, 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 three holes in the street side. Cop pulls him over. And Will said, it wasn't me. Matthew says, it wasn't me. So what do the cops do? Separate the two, stick them both in a room, and what do they say? You write out your friend, you get a deal. If you don't write out your friend, you go to jail. So, Will, you either testify against Matthew and will only give you, send you to jail for one year, or if we got to come after you, we're going to send you to jail for five years, but if he testifies against you, that you were the trigger man and he was just the accomplice, you go to jail for 20 years. So, you say nothing. You either go to jail for five years or 20 years, or you rat out your friend and you only go to jail for a year. But meanwhile, the other detective is in the other room looking at Matthew and doing what? Tell him the exact same deal. Throw him under the bus, you only go to jail for a year. You know, admit to what was going on and you only go to jail for a year. So you know, those are the kind of scenarios. So what, what's going to happen? So you start doing a payoff. So Will was like, well, dude. Do I risk it? What if, okay, Will was not a trigger man. But can Will trust that Matthew is going to keep his mouth shut? Because it's his word against Matthew's. Is he going to say, well, okay, um, if I keep my mouth shut, he keeps his mouth shut. Maybe we can get away with it because they, hopefully they don't have the evidence. But I can't trust that Matthew's not going to rat me out. So that whole scenario thing, that's one of the things we do in game theory, is sort of the, you know, thinking about what, what, what are the different combinations and what, what, what's the right decision for Will to do? What should Will do? Will, how well do you trust me? Uh, I'd rather him. Exactly. <laughs> that's probably, because writing him out, well, he's only going to go to jail for a year, but there's, what, what's the odds of Matthews to throw him under the bus and he ends up going down the road for five or 20 years? I believe Matthew would confess. Yeah, he thinks Matthew's weak and Matthew's going to crumble under pressure, so he's got to go in, so. Also, you got to think, if that was one of the bus, he's still going to be jail for about 20 years, so you're on the break right now. You ain't got to worry about him coming back at you for a while. Well, yeah, they could do that. Or they can just lie to him saying that his friend will let you back in. Yeah, and the cops do that. The cops can lie when they're trying to get you to confess. They can lie to you. Just be warned. The cops can lie to you. That ain't against law. You might think that's entrapment. It ain't entrapment. That is just one of those things. Cops can lie. You know, they can't fabricate evidence for that kind of stuff, but they can Certainly, lie to you, try to get you to confess. Just don't break the law and you don't have to worry about it. Or break the law and own it. But anyway, I just don't expect good paying jobs after you get out. So, um, but the idea of game theory is looking at different situations and trying to figure out what the moves and counter moves are going to be. You know, Will's got the option of do I stay quiet or write him out? Uh, Matthew's got the option of do I stay quiet or write him out. So what are the four combinations? They both stay quiet. Then they go to jail for five years. Will writes out Matthew. Will goes to jail for a year. Matthew goes to 20. 
Matthew writes out Will. Matthew goes to jail for a year. Will goes to jail for 20. Right. Those are the combinations. Those are the outcomes there. So what we do in game theory here is we look at what's called the payoff matrix. What are the combinations of the results that you can get? So Coke and Pepsi, if they decide to go into a price war, what happens if both Coke and Pepsi lower their price? Neither of them is going to get more market share. Let's just assume Coke and Pepsi the only two, okay? So Coke's selling half the sodas, Pepsi's selling half the sodas. Well, we lower our price. Well, we're still selling half. They're still selling half. So are we, we're not increasing our market share. But what's happening? We're getting a little less money per bottle. But what happens if Coke was to lower their price, but Pepsi didn't respond? Coke steals a bunch of customers. Coke sells a lot more. Pepsi sells a lot less. The other alternative, Pepsi lowers their price, but Coke doesn't. So Pepsi's the one that's going to increase their sales. Coke is the one that's going to lose sales. But the fourth alternative is neither of them decide to poke the bear. So, you know, Matthew and Will's other alternative is don't go shooting street signs when you're top even digital. No, don't go shooting street signs. Yes, obey all laws. So, so th 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 this is the examination here. This, this is the scenario that you end up looking at. But it's a fun intellectual exercise to be going in. And it happens for a lot of things. Um, I don't know. Um, Carrie, you have a girlfriend, right? Carrie has a girlfriend. Beyonce comes walking in and starts looking at Carrie. Carrie's got me. Do I stay with my girlfriend? Do I ditch my girlfriend and go out with Beyonce? Try to go out with Beyonce. It just, you, he's got all the scenarios. And it just, it's like, is he going to stick with his girlfriend and they have a solid relationship? He Maybe he goes out with Beyonce and they have a solid relationship. He dumps big team. Next thing is Carrie. Ariance, whatever when they blend the names together. Beyonce, Ari, I don't know where they were called, two of y'all together. Um, but maybe he's going to date Beyonce and then she's going to be like, uh, dude, who are you? And they're going to break up and then he's lost both girlfriends, right? Yeah. What, what are all the different alternative outcomes that, that can come from that? We could go for both. Or he could date <laughs> both. And how long is that one going to last? Depends on how good he is. <laughs> he ain't that good. <laughs> because unfortunately for him, Beyonce, social media, people are going to be like, woo! And they're going to be taking pictures of her. And well, granted, they're going to be trying to crop him out of the picture when they're posting these pictures of Beyonce on Instagram. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but I mean, it would be. Yeah. Uh, so. But just, there's a consideration. But you walk to the stank machine and you like, see them against playing everything else. Or nothing. Right? What do you enjoy doing? But overall, the price war can't destroy the profits that the oligopoly as a whole is making. If they start picking a fight, Coke lowers their price, Pepsi lowers theirs, Coke lowers theirs, Pepsi lowers theirs, McDonald's lowers their price, Hardee's does, Burger King does, suddenly they all are like not making profit anymore. So if somebody starts trying to pick a price fight, a price fight, a price fight uh, they're going to try to stop it as fast as possible. Remember when we were talking about oligopsonies a few weeks ago when I was talking about the four fast food restaurants competing to hire workers? And so I'm going to pay a higher wage or steal, get all good workers, and then somebody else could raise their wages. So suddenly we all went from paying seven and a quarter an hour to now we're all paying $13 an hour, and I still have 25% of the good ones and 25% of the losers. Remember that? Exact same thing here. Because we just went from oligops oligopsony in chapter four to oligopoly in chapter nine. We just changed one letter. The behaviors are ultimately end up being the same here. The, they can pick a fight, but it's going to ultimately hurt them in the long run. What happens with the valuation? If you raise the price, you're going to lose because people have alternatives. 
If Pepsi's like, well, I'm gonna raise my price so I can make more money for a bottle, yeah, they'll make more money for a bottle, but how many bottles are they gonna sell? Not very many. Because everybody's gonna be going to COVID. Which will sort of get you price leadership slightly later. But so here's the thing. Remember when we were talking oligopsonies and I talked about what well, wouldn't it be neat if the manager of McDonald's, the manager of Wendy's, the manager of Burger King, they all got together in the back room of Brian's Steakhouse one day and came up with that little agreement about, you know, let's none of us pay more than seven and a quarter an hour and everybody wins, which is illegal. The oligopsonies have that same option. It's illegal, but they have that temptation of Let's agree to not pick a fight. Germany and Russia, 1938, 1939, the non-aggression pact. You don't invade us, we won't invade you. Because Russia had a few other little small countries nearby that they wanted to pick off, and Germany wanted to go like take care of France and the rest of Europe, right? So you don't poke the bear, I won't poke the bear, shake hands, and walk away. There's a temptation there to, to work together. If you don't raise your prices, I will raise my prices. So we're all we're all happily selling the, our products at the same price. A Coke is the same price as a Pepsi, which is the same price as Dr. Pepper, which is so. Guess what? All sodas are selling for the same price, and the companies are kind of cooperating and agreeing that that's what the price is going to be. So what are those companies doing? They're acting like they're a monopoly. They're all agreeing on how much we're going to spend on advertisement, how much we're going to charge for our product. We're all going to do the same advertising. We're all going to do the same price. Well, if you're all doing the same thing, what are you doing? You're acting like you're all one company. So guess what? That's why it's illegal. Because that's sort of, they're acting like they're a trust. They're, well, we're independent, but we're not independent. The, the, the NFL football teams, that's what they do. They're 32 independent teams, but they have, they cooperate together, but there's some legal exemption from the federal government to let them do that. But they're technically 32 different businesses, but they work together and they pay their workers the same, the same drive and all that other un-American stuff. I'm closer to that slide. We can't say. Let us agree to not have a price war. So I can keep my price under a little bit high, you can keep your price a little bit high, and we can all make profit. So the industry as a whole would be making good profit. But the problem is, is, is Coke interested in maximizing the profit of the industry, or is Coke interested in maximizing the profit of Coke? So, Coke is interested in maximizing the profit for a Coke. So, yeah, maybe for the industry as a whole, we ought to keep doing the same thing that we've always been doing, but we ain't in it for the industry, we're in it for ourselves. How can we increase our profit? How can we increase our profit? We've got to sell more. Now, how can you sell more? Take the bite. There is the incentive for these companies to cooperate to try to keep prices high. Just like there was the incentive for companies to cooperate to try to keep wages low, there is the incentive to cooperate to keep prices high, but it's illegal. And actually, you've heard this term before, this actually is a cartel, is what they're doing. Independent companies acting as if they were the same company. Your drug cartels. You sell drugs in this area, I'll sell drugs in that area. You don't sell on my turf, I won't sell on your turf. And we all charge the same amount, we all win. So then we don't have turf wars, we're not shooting at one another, and my customers aren't coming to your territory, your customers aren't coming into my territory, but this price is the same, so everybody's gonna shop at the local closest dealer. OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, that's the same thing. They are a cartel. And what they're doing is they're limiting, it's like 13 of the like 15 largest oil producing countries in the world is in OPEC. 
like 13 out of the top 15. And what they said is, we all agree to limit production. We slow down production, we don't have to work as hard, and what we do by doing that is what happens to the supply curve. It goes back. So if demand is the same, what happens to the price? So we get a higher price and we don't have to work as hard. So that's what OPEC is trying to do. So they come up with per production agreements every year. Saudi Arabia, this is how much you're going to do. Iran, this is how much you're going to do. Kuwait, this is how much you're going to do. UAE, this is how much you're going to do. They come up with the agreement and there they go. And there also is the incentive to cheat. Because the okay, I'm slowing down production and price of oil is expensive. Price of oil is high, I can get a whole lot from my oil. Dude, wouldn't it be nice to just go ahead and sell a little bit more at a high price? So I'm selling a little bit more, Saudi Arabia is selling a little bit more, Kuwait is selling a little bit more, and next thing you know, everybody ends up cheating. All right, so suddenly the we wanted lower production, but everybody keeps this production kind of back to where it would have been if the rules had to have been there in the first place. Generally, you can use it. Um, globally, internationally, no. It is illegal to do this in the United States for companies to do it, but globally, yep, that is perfectly legal. Um, but that, which sometimes I, I I don't have time this semester. I take a detour and we talk about oil for like a half hour or so. But those countries that are digging up, that, that are producing oil, think, think about those countries like Saudi Arabia, Iraq. What do they have? Oil and what? Oil and sand. I, I, I mean, it's a little bit more than that, but it means sort of. But what's going to happen to that oil 100 years from now? They're not going to have it anymore. Because I haven't looked in the last couple of years, but the reserves for those countries were close, maybe at the rate that they're producing oil, pumping it out of the ground, they, by all of them are going to be out in 100 years. So then what are they going to have left to make money with? So what they have to do is they have to get the most money that they can out of this oil that they have. So which is better? To Pump it slow and sell it for a high price, or pump it fast and sell it for a low price. Pump it slow, milk that sucker for all its work, stay in business, and it take, it sell it for a high price, take some of that money and reinvest it into other technologies, other areas, other industries, so that when that well runs out, they've invested that money doing all these other things that they will keep there so their great grandkids have something to make money off of. And that's the thinking behind OPEC. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. That's as far responsible thing for them to do for their future. If they're just being greedy and looking at the right year right now, then yeah, they're going to be pumping more. But if they're looking to the future, they need to pump it slow, have the price be higher. And professional athletes do the exact same thing. You're a football player, you're a basketball player, how many years are you going to be playing in, in pros? Two, three, four, five years? The average football player is like three years. So maybe if you're lucky, you're working there for like eight years. But the money that you make during that time there needs to last you for the rest of your life, so you need to make the most out of the time that you are in the league because afterwards you may be so bent up and bruised up and have so much back pain and that kind of stuff that you just lost a whole lot of options for future employment. So what do you need to do when you bring in these millions of dollars, don't spend it on parties, you need to take some of this money and squirrel it away and buy yourself a car dealership or buy yourself some other kind of business or something to make you money for the rest of your life, put it in a 401k, something. So. I already talked about this. I should have had it on. Well, I don't like it. Doesn't matter. But overall, yeah, there's a conflict here: industry profits versus company profits. That's what we talked about. That's what this slide is talking about. So it's like, 
what's good for the industry may not be as good for us as the individual business. So there's issues there. So there is one company in each industry that can lower the price. The smart one to pick the fight, that's going to be the one that is the most efficient. The most efficient producer, they're going to be the ones that are the price leader. What they do with the price is going to dictate what everybody else does with the price. In terms of liquid Coke sells about half again as much soda as Pepsi does. Coke sells a crack ton more than our Hero for Sun Drops and our Pepper. So Coke, they produce it more efficiently. Coke, I'm gonna make up numbers here. Coke is probably making 30 cents profit for a bottle of soda. Pepsi may be making 20 cents profit. Sundrop may be making 3 cents profit. So is Sundrop going to be in a hurry that, well, I can lower my prices by 5%? Yeah. Nope, because they went all of their profit, right? So they can't do that. Is Pepsi going to lower their price? Yes. Maybe. Yeah. They can. And, but how about Coke? Yeah. If a price war happens, who's going to remain standing the longest? Coke. Because they can lower their price pretty quickly to the point where some has got to get out of the game. They can lower their price pretty quickly where Dr. Pepper has to get out of the game. they got to work out a little bit more to lower their price where Pepsi cannot afford to play anymore. But is Pepsi going to pick a fight with Coke? that they can't win. This would be like, I don't know, any NFL linebacker comes walking into this classroom and for, well, am I going to go over there and start poking in the eyeball? I can't win that fight. If a lion was to come walking in this room, am I going to go over there and kick it in the teeth? That's a fight I can't win. Am I going to start it? I sure hope not. But I ain't blessed with most intelligence, so you never know. Maybe it's the... If I was between them in the doorway and I thought I could run faster than the lion, just go for the eye. So, what? Go for the eye. Yes. So, um, so, the only one that is going to pick the fight and lower the price is going to be the least, I mean, the most efficient one. Because Pepsi, Coke, we're going to lower the price because we're going to want to steal, company, steal business away from these other companies. Pepsi, they might say, well, we want to, we'd like to lower our price and steal some sodas away, steal some sales away. But Coke is a, they're going to match it step for step. So we need to get my sales away from Coke. Maybe we get a little bit of whatever when Dr. Pepper and Suntrop go out of business, but do we want to risk it? The answer is so. So is Pepsi going to raise their price? No, because then everybody's going to be drinking Coke. Is Sundrop going to raise their price? No, because then everybody can be drinking Mountain Dew. So who can raise their price? Coca-Cola. Maybe. Because if Coke raises their price, what is somebody like Sundrop going to do? They're going to say, woo -hoo! Man, They're going to raise their price instantly. They're going to have that feeling that you have after you finish your Thanksgiving meal and you slide back to the table and you unhook your belt and let your, let your gut hang out. That's the feeling today. Woo! We just went from making three cents profit to five cents profit. Score! Our profit just went up by six, 66%. Score! They would look at it as relief there. So if Coke was to raise their price, Dr. Pepper would join them. Sundrop would join them. Pepsi would think about it, but they're like, well, we ain't making as much profit, so we could keep our price lower and try to steal more, and then Coke is going to come back and lower their price right back and screw us over. Or we could just be satisfied raising our price too and making more money for the same amount of sodas too. So what's Pepsi going to end up doing? Raise their price too. The one that's calling the shots is Coca Cola because they're the most efficient one. They're the one that calls the shots on where the price is going to be. If they lower their price, everybody else has got to go along. If they raise their price, everybody's going to say, Woohoo! Thank you, man. They're going to raise their price.
Christ is focus on the is of Christ is does that make sense to you? Um okay there was something let me okay I skip something let me like see if I can remember where it's gonna go. Um back to the Ideally, Coke and Pepsi. Yep. If they wanted to maximize industry profits, they would go in a back room somewhere and they would say, well, you sell yours for a dollar, I'll sell mine for a dollar, we'll call it even, and we'll fleece the suckers, we won't go into a price war. Ideally, yep. they could do that, which we talked about. But they're not going to do it. Because it's illegal. Because they don't want to go to jail, pay fines, whatever, that kind of thing. But here's the thing. Is there cooperation between Coke and Pepsi? It's hard to say. Absolutely. There is some unspoken something, and a word we're looking for is tradition. Because here's the thing. Have y'all ever seen Coke go on sale? Coke on sale this week. Have you ever seen Pepsi on sale? Yeah. Do you see Coke and Pepsi on sale at the same time? No. Because what would be the point of Coke and Pepsi both going on sale at the same time? It's good for us. No, it is good for us as customers, but for the company, I mean, no point. they're, they're just selling the more for less. Business. Yeah, they're doing the exact same thing. They're just selling more for less, and they're not stealing any customers away from anybody else. The point of doing this, putting it on sale, is a little bit price discrimination. The point of we're going to lower it. Temporarily put the price of Pepsi on sale, make it cheap. So some of y'all cheat states might say, well, dude, Pepsi's cheap. Let me try some Pepsi. And then I go at home and I'm drinking this Pepsi. And I'm like, dude, this is awesome. Where has Pepsi been all my life? And then when Pepsi goes back to full price, y'all will keep drinking it because y'all join the Pepsi generation. Whereas Coke, the reason why they put it on sale is for the same thing. We lower our price. Some of y'all cheat states will end up starting to drink Coke and and you start saying, Ooh, this is a real thing, Coke was right. And y'all can keep buying it even when it's full price. That's the point of it. So if they both go on sale at the same time, which are you going to get? The one you like the best, right? Just as if the price was the same. But so what ends up happening is Cokes and Pepsi's are not on sale at the same time. But they do go on sale. And it's not like the manager of Pepsi, the CEO of Pepsi, the CEO of Coke sit down in the back room of some restaurant somewhere with a calendar and like, okay, we're going to go on sale this week and this week and this week. Ooh, I really want 4th of July. No, they ain't going to sit there and do that. What you do is tradition. I'm going to make up stuff because I don't know. But it's going to be like, well, we're Coke and we always put our products on sale the second week of the month. That's just what we do. Whenever we're going to pitch a sale, we do it the second week of the month, so everybody, all of our distributors, they know how to, they know about it. They can plan on it, knowing they need to carry extra sodas to all the stores and all of our employees and all. So we we always do our sales on the second week of the month. So Pepsi's going to be like, well, Coke always does their sales on the second week of the month. We don't want to have to put our stuff on sale on the second week of the month. We'll always go on sale on the fourth week of the month. So that is tradition. Month after month after month, year after year after year, Coke is on sale on the second week of the month. Pepsi's on sale on the fourth week of the month. Nothing's ever said. Nothing, no, no agreement. That kind of thing. But what would Coke do if Pepsi decided, yeah, we're going to do a national blitz the same time Coke is on sale? That's poking the bear, right? Are they going to want to poke the bear? No. So there's just unspoken agreement there. They can't prove that they're colluding with one another because they're not talking about it. They're just sort of, well, we're sticking with doing what we've always done, and everybody knows what we always do. And if they don't know, well, they ain't paying attention. Then that's their problem. Right. So, lowering the price, you're trying to get more sales, you're trying to steal sales from our competitors. You can, going back to the Lions, you, there is a thing called predatory pricing. Predator, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> maybe. Okay. Uh, predators. What do predators do? Kill. What does a lion do? Kill. What does a tiger do? Kill. 
What does Predator do? Kill. Right? So. So, predatory pricing is, well, we're not just going to lower our price in order to temporarily get some more market share or something like that. We're going to lower our price in order to kill. This would be Coke saying, well, we're not just trying to increase our sales. We're, like, we're getting tired of that pesky sun drop with a fine quality soap that's so much better than mellow yellow. And just, we want to kill them. So we're going to lower our price low enough because we can, because we're more fish than they are. We're going to lower our price to the point that, Coke, that sun drop can't compete. Right now they're making, I don't know, like three cents of the can. So let's lower our price by 10 cents. See what happens. Coke lowers your price by 10 cents. Well, what, what, what can SunDrop do? Lower their price by 10 cents. Suddenly they're losing 7 cents a can. Or leave their price high and lose a whole bunch of sales because everybody else is going to drink Mountain Dew or Mellow Yellow instead of the more expensive SunDrop. Either way, how long can SunDrop survive that way? Losing a big chunk of your sales or lowering your price and losing everything forever. It ends up being a game of chicken. And who's going to win? Coca-Cola. Because they've got more money they can hold out longer. They can even lower their price by, they can lower their price by 30 cents. Break even. And how, how and that would be having SunDrop losing 27 cents a bottle. Just can't do it, right? So they could kill. This is kind of illegal. The government doesn't like that. Killing, because what's going to happen? Okay, we lower our price, SunDrop goes out of business. We lower our price, Dr. Pepper goes out of business. And then it's just the two of us. Us and Pepsi. And then what can we do? We can raise our prices and we just stole the market share because instead of us, Coke having 45%, Pepsi having 45%, everybody else battling over the other 10%, Coke got big, Pepsi got big, we can raise our price, boom, there we go. So that's predatory pricing, lowering your price with the intent to kill. Does this happen? Yes. Yes. Um, breakfast cereal. This one happened. Dude, it might be 20 years ago now. The big five cereal companies. Who are they? General Mills. General Mills. Kellogg's. Post. Yeah. Quaker Oats. Corn checks, rice checks, wheat checks, checks, make checks, cereal. Oh, oh, excuse me. No, no. Oh, ooh, no, I'm about to get mixed up. That was Ross and Purina. The wheat checks, corn checks, rice checks, wheat checks. Quaker oats. I don't understand it. Cam Crunch, the leading kid cereal in America by like a three to one margin over second place. Nasty and has a weird aftertaste. So, I mean, it's pretty cool. Captain yeah. Crunch. Yeah. Captain Crunch. I'm down with buy a lot of but my, One of my goals in life is that theoretically you can just buy bags of the Lucky Charms marshmallows in one of these days. I'm going to do it. Someone made a Lucky Charms beer and a four pack sold for like $500. Oh, my. Yeah. So let's talk about these companies. General Mills. How big of a company but are how big of a company are they? They're pretty big because they do a whole lot more than cereal. Cereal in the grand scheme of things may only be 20% of what they do. Kellogg's, how big are they? They're pretty darn big. Post. Post is, when it comes to cereal sales, the back in the day, and I'm not they may be in third place, but not too far behind. Post was part of a company called Philip Morris. Does anybody know who Philip Morris is? Tobacco. Tobacco. Cigarettes. Let's talk about cigarettes for like eight seconds. Carton cigarettes. Ten packs. Carton cigarettes. You pay $30 for it. Right? Those of you who smoke. Any of you smoke? 
Good, good deal. Yeah. yeah, but like for that thirty dollars, like twenty of it is like tax, because government's trying to keep people from smoking. So a ten dollar card of cigarettes. How much tobacco is in a ten dollar card of cigarettes? It's between five and ten cents. So then you throw in for a whole card of cigarettes. I don't know a couple cents worth of paper and glue. And there, these suckers are getting rolled and packaged or whatever by machine. So you have some machines and some labor going. What's it costing them to make a pack of cigarettes? Next to nothing. And they're selling them for $10 a piece. So, Philip Morris, back in the day, back when this happened, they owned both cereals. They owned Miller beer. They owned a bunch of other food things too. Uh, um, R.J. Reynolds, the tobacco company, they do Marlboro and, no, that was Philip Morris with Marlboro. Uh, uh, Winston's and Salem's and I can't remember, R.J. They owned like Oreo, Nabisco, all that. They owned that company back in the day. So, Post might be third place, but they've got a nice war chest behind them. There's a big pile of cash behind them. Quaker Oaks. Oaks. Granola bars. Not a whole lot going on. Can you read them? Dog food, cat food. Not a whole lot else going on there. So I'm not sure who it was. I think it was Pokes. I've never actually taken the time to go back and try to find out. So I went along my Pokes. Uh, I'm going to say it was them. They said, we're going to lower the price of cereal dollar a box. It went to like $4 a box out of $3 a box. That's huge. So, what did General Mills and Kellogg's do? Same thing. They did the same thing. What did Quaker Oaks do? Said, oh, crap. What did Purina Sutton do? Oh, crap. <laughs> so, what ended up happening? The price is blowing up. Purina said, we can't do this anymore. And they sold out. One of the big three bought them out. I also can't remember which one. But we went from five cereal companies to four cereal companies. And Quaker Oats was sitting there trembling in their boots. <laughs> the, other, the big three raised their prices. Quaker Oats, woo! And they survived. Because the government. They were looking, they were casting a hairy eyeball in this direction, and if they, Quaker Oaks, would have gotten killed too, the government would have cracked down hard on these three governments. So it's like, well, we just killed one, and let's not kill the others, and okay, and there we go. What do you mean by, you know, great evidence? Oh, the government would have started asking, was there cooperation, was there collusion, was there any kind of agreements, that kind of stuff, plus the whole, oh, which, maybe we have a dumping, Can we talk about dumping? Less of us selling, selling for price that is below your cost to reduce with the intent to kill. That kind of stuff is illegal. Because we want fair, you can be fairly. We've got rules. We, everybody plays by the same rules. We play fairly, and everybody wins. We have a fair game, and you win based on how good your product is. You win based on merit, not based on evil. And purposely killing people, that's kind of evil. It's like that one movie where the guys are playing football and the dude's running toward the end zone and the next day he pulls out a gun and bam, 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 shoots the safety and then runs in for the touchdown. And then he kneels down, shoots the ball, blows his own head off because he's like, like whacked out on. He's either on drugs, no, no, he's he being blackmailed to throw the game because somebody like hits his sister kidnap or something like that. Uh, uh, I'll come up with the, the last Boy Scout in that movie that came out before y'all were born. Bruce Willis, David Wayne. Okay. So, get with me on the. Okay. So, monopolistic competition takes some of the aspects of monopolies, some of the aspects of pure competition, and they get put together. Ultimately, you have markets where the companies are producing similar goods, but they're different. Kind of like in the oligopoly thing, but there's a lot of people doing it. But it's, and it's relatively easy to do. The best example 
my favorite one, the one I'm going to use, is restaurants. Think of a restaurant here. How many restaurants are there in South Hill? Probably 30 is going to be my guess. What do they all do? They all cook food, they bring it out, you sit at the table, you sit in the chair, they bring out food, they bring out the drinks, they serve food, you eat the food, they clean up things and charge you money. Be more specific. Some of them, we sell hamburgers, they're selling hamburgers. We're selling tacos, they're selling tacos. Right? Similar menu you say. But are there differences? Is there a difference between Burger King and McDonald's? They do a lot of the same stuff, these differences. It's a gift between burger at McDonald's and then Brian's Steakhouse across the street. And then that little itty bitty burger that you can get if you go to Cahill's and walk away hungry. After paying price to eat. But how easy is it to ever run a restaurant? It ain't that hard. Because guess what? There's probably a couple of empty restaurants already in town that already have ovens and refrigerators, that kind of stuff. You just need to find somebody who knows how to cook. You don't know how to cook. You use the tables and chairs to make it happen. Then you just pay, you know, need to raise like a few hundred dollars a month to pay for the rent for the building and then a little bit of electricity for the building. You need to hire somebody that knows how to cook. It ain't that hard to do a restaurant. So, you have many people doing it, and the products are differentiated. Yes. Because there's a difference between, I don't know, hamburgers and tacos. Tacos is just a hard shell hamburger, right? There's a difference between a taco and a pizza. How about that? There's a difference between a pizza, a slice of pizza, and a chicken wing, right? Yeah. So there, <coughs> there's differences, but it depends on how you define the end market. You don't really say restaurants as a whole. You say fast food restaurant, burger joints, pizza joints, chicken places, Mexican restaurants. So that might be the you know, Mexican restaurants. Now, are there differences between the different Mexican restaurants in town? Yeah, but are there similarities? Yeah. They're a lot similar, but one of them salsa is a little bit sweeter than the other one, and one of them uses cheaper meat than the other one, right? And y'all know which one is which, right? Tell me. I love good Mexican food. Okay. There's many firms. Products are different, but there's low entry barriers, which is why there's many firms going in, because it's relatively easy to do. Each company is going to have some power within its area, but not for the entire industry. If Brothers Pizza and Blackstone, if they were to like lower their prices on their pizzas, what would the pizza joint across the street do? They would probably do the same. But what would a pizza joint in Times Square, New York City, would they react? No, because they're not competing, because they're 600 miles away, 400 miles away. So within the area, the, the gas station in Alberta is competing with the other gas stations in Alberta, and they're going to react to one another, but the gas stations in Alberta, the ones in South Hill are going to ignore them. The ones in Ottawa are going to ignore them, right? So you have some power within your area, but not over the entire industry. So you are a price setter within reason. Okay, a K Hills burger is better than a Brian's burger, quality wise. A Brian's burger is better than a McDonald's burger, quality wise. So okay, Brian's uses fresh beef, McDonald's uses frozen. Brian's can sell a burger, get away with selling one for like five or six dollars, where McDonald's is selling for three or four, right? But then Cahill's, because we've got, I don't know, we got atmosphere and we use these artisanal buns or whatever they do, they're going to charge ten dollars burger, right? So they can determine, well, we're going to charge a little bit more, a little bit less, that kind of stuff. But could Cahill's get away with selling their burgers for eighty-five dollars a piece? No. Because People might, yeah, well, it might be better than Brian's, but it ain't that much better, so, right? It ain't $85 worth. So, so you have some control over your price because you have some influence over your customers. You have some influence over the quality of your products. You have some influence over your price, but you can't get carried away. 
selling a scoop of ice cream for twenty dollars, selling a hamburger for eighty-five dollars. You just can't do it. You gotta be the ballpark of everybody else. You don't have to be exactly like everybody else, but you have to be in the ballpark. And there's a reason why our price is a little bit higher. Better service, better atmosphere, better whatever. And that's so you get not only getting the food, you're not only getting the service, you're getting this other stuff too. So that's what's going on there. Um, on a Friday night, which would you rather go to on the date? Applebee's or McDonald's? Because you're not just getting food, you're getting atmosphere, you're getting <coughs> people looking at you like, ooh, they got no money to go to Applebee's. And leave hungry. <laughs> just, yeah, just, so you got to be priced that are within reason. And here again, advertising has a big role, but only three of the four. You can talk about, we exist, this is our menu. You can talk about, you're hungry, you know you're hungry, you know you want a burger, you know you want our burger because our burgers are fantastic. You can talk quality, we're better than they are. But you don't usually compete on price in advertising. Come to Bob's, you got the cheapest hot dogs in town. How many of y'all are interested in eating at that restaurant? I don't know, can you sell hot dogs so low they gotta be some nasty, sorry, cup rate meat that you picked up off the side of the road somewhere? You, you, you people will question quality when the price gets low. So to go around saying, we're the cheapest in town, we're cheaper than they are. Come to Bergen, we're cheaper than they are. That's not really the best place to be. For these things, where it's easy to do and there's plenty of alternatives. For car companies, yeah. Who's going to be saying we're cheaper? Kia, we're cheaper than Toyota. Well, we got this can sell at the quality record, but we're cheaper. They can get away with selling that. Because they've got these other stuff that they can talk about, but you're, you know, we got the cheapest food in town. And that's kind of what Big difference between here, between monopolistic competition and oligopolies, you know, we got more than one company, but we have a whole lot more instead of two, three, five, eight, you know, we got 30 restaurants in Southfield alone. How many radio stations are there? Don't get picked up with 15 of them on your radio dial on your car on the drive home, and that's just the ones that are broadcasting out of either Raleigh or Richmond, and guess what? You go two hours west of here where I live, I can get any of the stations we all do. I'm getting a different 15 out of Greensboro and Murrow. How many radio stations are there in the country? 500, 1,000, are they different? Even the, I don't, even the country stations. We're playing old country, we're playing new country, nothing that it is. We, we do three country, one hip hop, just keep it right. They're different. There's a difference between radio, okay, so we're the cheapest radio city. You can say that. The radio. They're all we're the best radio station in town. Uh, yes. Uh, so there's more people doing it. It's easier to do, and usually, and this is the fun one, it's usually they're covering smaller geographic areas. The radio stations in Richmond are only serving people in the greater Richmond area. People in New York don't care what kind of music the stations in Richmond are broadcasting. They don't know, they don't care. And the radio station in New York City, I dare say, there's like Netto playing country music. Right. Let alone old country. The only kind of country is you have to go country. Like, go old or go home. Country music is not country music anymore. It's just it's like watered down pop, but then pop music is not good. You have a musical instrument in your hand. Don't you? you, you Play the thing! Play it well! Don't just hit three buttons on your keyboard, hit repeat, and boom, here's your drum track. Hit the keyboard four times, boom, and that's your bass. Play good music for you. That's why I can't stand American Idol because the music weak behind them. I don't care how good the singers are when the music is just like, but American behind them. And country music, half of those musicians, I'm just standing up here my flat job, but I just keep, 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 I ain't doing nothing, but I'm just, that ain't, that's like, I'm holding the guitar, but it ain't like me and any amps. 
because last thing they need is be broadcast meetings with people occasionally getting strings out of tune. Anyway, I digress. I like a little bit of indie thing kind of music, but it's got to be done well. I don't care what it is as long as it's done well. Do it well. So, um, I'll stop on that note. <laughs> we will finish this later that day. Um, Monday, Tuesday.